is. Oh, so, the narrative. Okay. Oh, yeah. it matters a lot because it, yeah. Do you ever see our newsletter that we do? We do a daily newsletter. I, I know everything about your work. So <laughs> I, I know about the daily newsletter and I know about signing up. I know all of the amazing promotions. $3, $3 for three months. Okay. Uh, I, I, after this call, I'm going to get my myself together. <laughs> you know, it's a little embarrassing. Oh, no, no, because we're, we're writing kind of, and kind of what we're trying to do is take a oh you and i should have a we should have a chat afterwards um okay. is do a uh you know like here's the take of the moment you know so every day we're writing kind of like this and so this is different than say academics or analysts who's you know you guys will spend time to think about things to you know to really and we're doing the here's the hot take on something yes. and and it's just to try to get people oh. to, to think about things in the moment Yes. Yeah. A lot of value to that, especially given how quickly things change. So, so fast. I mean, it's yeah. so yeah, fast. It's like even the, I love, you know, you did an episode about the uh, Nigerian, okay, well, let's just answer this. Okay. No. Uh, no. Not you. And the chat box is. Well, hi. Nice to see you. Nice. <laughs> this is funny. Oh, I'm, I'm not even able to send him a message, actually. No. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, but can, can you hear? Can you hear us? Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can hear everything. Should we get started now, or are other people looking, or what are we? And and how is okay. just is it just us speaking, and it's going to be recorded, used, or is there are people? Mm -hmm. Okay. Should we wait until they join? Because right now we only have one person. Okay. And um oh, go ahead. A question about oh, okay. share screen. I see that mine is disabled and I have slides. So is it does the host enable that function or? Oh, this is okay. And then correct me, we're each doing about 20 minutes, right? Yeah, I, okay. I, I was going to Okay. Okay. So allow me to record your meetings. I'm going to try to do it from my side. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm still trying to enable share screen on my end. So I guess we should start. Okay. I mean, I guess I'll get started. You okay. Know. Okay. I'll okay. Clear my... okay. Good morning, everyone. I, I'm going to take over hosting duties now because I think we're having some technical difficulties with our host. Uh, my name is Eric Olander. I am the managing editor of the China Africa Project. I'm also host of the China in Africa podcast, which is a podcast that, that together with my co-host, uh, Dr. Kobus van Staden, from the South African Institute of International Affairs. We've been hosting and producing since 2010. We've produced almost uh, 520 episodes now. So a huge archive of hundreds of episodes is available for you to check out if you're interested in a lot of the topics that we're gonna discuss today about China-Africa relations, you can go to chinaafricaproject.com. So what I'm gonna do for our discussion today is before we get to Aisha, who's going to go a little bit more, she's going to drill down into a specific case study based on her research. I'm going to give you the big picture and where we are today. And again, 
uh, this is a fast-moving, multifaceted, very, very complex subject uh, that is very difficult to cover in an hour, much less 10 hours, much less 500 episodes as we've done. So take everything we say with a little bit of a grain of salt in the sense that we're putting very broad brushes over this in order to make room for time. So first of all, the limitations of our discussion. Talking about Africa is a ridiculous concept because Africa is a, con is a continent of 54 countries, hundreds of languages, thousands of cultures. It's so diverse. There is no single Africa. And I know a lot of people will talk about that in the African context, but then they'll also often mistakenly think that there is a single China. China, too, is uh, thousands of languages, lots of dialects, uh, lots of, of variety. There is no single China in many respects as well. And when we talk about the Chinese in Africa, we're not just talking about the Chinese government from Beijing. There's a whole array of different actors who are there. So there's a variety and a diversity of actors on the African side, and there's a variety and a diversity of actors on the Chinese side. Okay, so with that little disclaimer out of the way, uh, I want to, I'll get started here. Number one, my goal today with our discussion is to leave you more confused than you are right now at the beginning of our discussion. Okay, now that sounds totally counterintuitive because normally you'd think, well, we're gonna come to a conversation about a geopolitical topic, we're gonna learn something and we're gonna feel like we know more. But if you walk away from our discussion today feeling like you have more clarity and it's easier to understand, then you've missed something. Because if you're coming to the China-Africa relationship thinking that China's engagement in Africa is all good, win-win, that's what the Chinese will tell you. Everything that the Chinese are doing is great, it's wonderful. You're missing a big part of the story. But if you're coming to the China-Africa story thinking that it's all bad, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to Africa, well, you're also missing a big part of the story. Because the good and the bad in this story sit side by side one another. And so we can sit here for the next hour and say that China is the worst thing that's ever happened to Africa, and we can find lots of great examples that would 100% be true, okay? At the same time, we can find examples 100% that would be true and accurate that China is the best thing. So it is a combination of the two. And when you believe or see one side of the story, you have to recognize that there are other sides. It's so varied and so complex. So that's a really important part of this conversation. Now, I'm gonna try and bring some concepts to you that will be a little bit counterintuitive, okay? Because a lot of people define Africa's relationship with the outside world in strictly economic terms. Now that makes a lot of sense because for four, five, six hundred years, Africa's value to the outside world has been shaped and defined based on resource extraction, resource exploitation, expansion of markets through colonialism and imperialism. And that's the way that the outside world for a long time has seen Africa, and that's how many African stakeholders see their value to the outside world. Now, when the Chinese first started going to Africa back in the, say, the 2000s, and we'll call this the modern era of Chinese engagement in Africa, because China's been engaging in Africa since the 16th century when Admiral Zheng He first, 15th or 16th century, I'll, I forget which one, but Admiral Zheng He first went there, and then there was a long gap in time when the Chinese kind of turned inwards, didn't actually go to the outside world very much. And then in the Cold War era, China re-engaged Africa, but in ideological terms. We're, we're going to skip that part for our discussion. For the purposes of our discussion, or at least my presentation today, we're really talking about the mid-2000s, when China launched an initiative called the Going Out period. And this was done by President Hu Jintao. And the idea was that the Chinese economy was growing very rapidly. And in order for them to really expand and there was this idea we need to engage. Now, at that time in the mid 2000s, China's options were not very nowhere near as robust as they were today. So going into Europe was very, very expensive, lots of regulations, big high barrier to entry. Going into the United States, similarly, very expensive, lots of, you know, to, in order to, to get into that market, very like a high barrier of entry, lots of regulations, very expensive to market products across a market as big as the US. So here was Africa. The United States was bogged down in the mid 2000s 
in wars in the Middle East and South Asia. The United States had largely disengaged from, from Africa for the most part. Europe has not taken Africa seriously for a long time. And it was kind of wide open, low barrier to entry. Africans were also very, very eager to engage China. China came and said, we want to bring investment. We want to bring capital. We want to build infrastructure. We want to create opportunities for our state-owned enterprises. We have people who want to come. All of that was warmly received at the time in the mid-2000s. So that's kind of coming up, but very, very low barrier to entry. Now, a couple of statistics for you, and I'm going to drop a little bit of data for you. Back in 2008, China sourced 30% of its oil from Africa, mm -hmm. from three countries, from Sudan, Republic of Congo, and uh, Angola. Ten years later, in 2018, that was to see those written crewmates on top. I'm sorry, what? That's the good guy. An imposter is the bad guy. Oh, hello? for me. Okay, you, um, oh, yeah, I think you have to mute. Some of you guys have to mute your, uh, mute your, yourselves there. Um, so 10 years later, by 2018, that number had fallen to 18% of the oil had been sourced from Africa. And uh, now it's only coming from one country in the top 10, which is Angola. And this is the case across the board. So when we look at China-Africa trade, 70% of what China buys from Africa is oil, mineral, and timber. That's 70%. It comes from mostly about 10 different countries. So we're not talking about pan-African trade. The rest of Africa, for the most part, does not sell China very much, but imports a lot. So we have a very, very a high imbalance in trade for most of Africa. Only a few African countries have balanced trade, and those are mostly those who sell oil and natural resources. But here's my point that I'm trying to make, very, very key point here, that since the mid-2000s, China, when it didn't have many other choices as to where it could go to buy oil, mineral, and timber, fast forward 10, 15 years, now has lots of choices of where it can buy oil, mineral, and timbers. So last year, oil purchases from Saudi Arabia shot up by 47%. Chinese oil purchases have shifted off of Africa and are now in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East and from Russia. The same can be said for timber. They're now doing a third more trade with South America than they're doing with Africa. $300 billion a year in 2019 compared to $200 billion a year uh, with Africa. So we're seeing across the board, Africa is becoming less economically important to China every year. And that, is, that challenges the assumptions that so many people have about why China is interested in Africa. Because everybody, you hear this a lot, China's trying to colonize Africa, China's trying to conquer Africa, China's trying to steal the resources. And they're using oftentimes an antiquated view of China. They're using what China is, say, for example, like the British East India Company, a classic kind of imperialism type of mindset. I contend that China has less in common with British imperialism than it does with Goldman Sachs. China-Africa, that relationship is a uniquely 21st century phenomenon. It couldn't have happened in the, in the pre-globalization you know, pre pre era. And so what we're seeing now is the transition away from economic in, in, integration to political priorities. So today, and we just saw this last week on full display, China can get the oil and the timber and the mineral for, with very few exceptions from pretty much anywhere along the Belt and Road. And it is doing that now. It's diversifying its trade, moving away from Africa on economic stuff. But it cannot get 54 votes at the United Nations, 54 votes at the World Health Organization. It cannot get a, a coalition of, of African countries to whap the United States over the head on Huawei or on Xinjiang or on Hong Kong or on South China Sea. Increasingly, those votes are more important than the cash and the money. Okay, And that we saw on full display last week at the United Nations, where we have these dueling letters Going, over on, going on about Xinjiang, for example. So the United States and Germany wrote a letter and they got all of these signatories from mostly uh, global North countries and advanced economies to say, China's bad on Xinjiang. And then China rallies its friends in the global South, including eight African countries to say, you know what? Human rights in the US and Europe are the problem, not Xinjiang. 
And the value of those letters and countries putting their names to those letters is becoming increasingly important. Now, this is very, very difficult for a lot of African stakeholders to get their minds around because for so long, they've seen their value to the outside world in resources, economics, and trade, but not in politics. And so there's a lack of understanding in terms of what the Chinese motivations are, and also where does Africa fit within the broader China global trade portfolio. Let me be very, very clear to you today. Africa as a continent is not economically important to China. It is often overstated that Africa is very important and China needs Africa. Let me just be super clear here. Last year, China, you know, yeah, it was last year and the year before, China did around $200 billion, okay? The peak of China-Africa trade was in 2015 at about $220 billion, okay? So let's take it at the peak at $220 billion. Now, for a continent like Africa, that is a lot of trade. When you consider by the fact that the United States does about $45 billion, maybe 50, and most of what the United States trades with Africa is hydrocarbons. Take hydrocarbons out and there's very little that they buy. So China-Africa trade is still very, very large. But when you put it in the context of what China does with the rest of the world, and 2019, China, China's global trade was $4.14 trillion. So $200 billion out of $4.14 trillion is insignificant. It's less than half of a percent. So what that means is that if Africa disappears tomorrow off of China's balance sheet, they won't even notice it. They won't even notice it. And again, it goes to this point that the economics of the relationship are increasingly becoming secondary to the politics of the relationship. Because at the United Nations, Malawi's vote is just as important as Poland's vote. Is, you know, Lesotho's vote is just as important as, as, as Russia's vote in that sense, it just in the General Assembly. Okay? So putting that context is really important to understand where. Now, that discrepancy between 200 billion and 4.14 trillion also creates a lot of problems. Okay, remember what I said, I want to confuse you in our discussion today. So, when China negotiates with a country like Ghana, it's got a huge discrepancy in size. There's an asymmetrical difference in the size. What choice does Ghana have in terms of exercising its power and its agency? Now, China will tell you, we do not interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. That is a, a benchmark Chinese foreign policy uh, statement. We, we, we do not. Unlike the United States, unlike Europe, who's very interventionist, they will say we do not. And the Chinese will tell you, when you go to Beijing and sit in the foreign ministry, as I have on many occasions, and you meet with people, they'll bring you into a nice room. And they'll, sh they'll give you a presentation to introduce you to Chinese foreign policy. And one of the first things that they will tell you, China has never invaded another country. China has never colonized another country. And China has never military attacked another country. These are the three things that they will say. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say, we are not like the Europeans and the Americans who have done all of that. They will also remind you that the same colonizers who occupied, stole, and pillaged Africa did the same thing to China. And that's something that's lost on a lot of African stakeholders, is they're not aware that there was British imperialism, French imperialism, Portuguese imperialism, and even American imperialism in China as well. So they will say, we are, we are peers, but it's not quite that simple. Because when the big giant panda sits down and says, here's the deal, Mr. Ghana, we are equals. But at the end of the day, my economy is so much bigger and more powerful than yours, okay? But I'm going to give you a few rules. I'm not going to interfere in the internal affairs of your country. But there's something that I call 4THKXJS. <laughs> That's my little you know, way of remembering what the lines are that China is very, very clear about. So if you play by the rules of 4THKXJS, all will be good in the China-Africa relationship. But if you mess with 4THKXJS, you will have problems. And this is where the asymmetry starts to show itself. So 
What is 4THKXJS? Very important. Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, the Communist Party. Those are the four T's, okay? HK is Hong Kong, XJ is Xinjiang, S is the South China Sea. These are China's red lines. You cross the red lines and you suffer wholeheartedly. It's not like the United States or a European government. When the United States government gets into a dispute with another country, they kind of, for the most part, keep it confined to that. So if it's a political dispute, they'll, they'll withdraw their ambassador, they will bring it at the United Nations and offer condemnation. Or if it's an economic dispute, they will, again, Trump has kind of changed a little bit of this, but up until the Trump era, things were kind of in the silos of economic culture and whatnot. China brings a whole of government approach to when people violate 4THKXJS, okay? What that means is that look at sing uh, uh, look what's going on in Australia, look what's going on in Sweden, look what's going on in Norway and Europe and these other countries that have violated those that th those red lines and the punishment that comes down is pulling visas for students, pulling cultural events, blocking trade, all of that. Now you're Ghana, you want to make sure that those pathways stay open. Because now China today is the largest destination, the most popular destination for African students in the world. They just became number one. Last year, 82,000 students from Africa studied in China. Not all on scholarships, but, but certainly quite a few. You want to make sure those students still have a pathway. China is one of the largest sources of capital for infrastructure development. Very difficult, very expensive for African governments to raise money in the global capital markets. That's what we're seeing today in the economic crisis. They're getting hit hard by the credit ratings agencies. China is negotiating a lot of this. We can talk about debt traps and debt in your questions because that is the most important topic right now of 2020 in Africa. But they want to keep all of that going. They want the products to keep coming in. All of the low cost goods are very good for consumers. They help keep inflation down. They like the techno phones. They like the, the new software services. They want investment to come in. The moment they start talking about Taiwan and Xinjiang and things like that, all of that can stop. So I have the, what I call the Jay-Z rule of foreign policy. And the Jay-Z rule of foreign policy says, I've got 99 problems and Xinjiang is not one. And so if you are Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, you know what? This isn't my problem. So the United States and Europe, they're kind of standing up for human rights in Xinjiang among the Muslim population, noble as it is, wonderful. But that is not in the core strategic interest of the South African government right now. The number one priority for every single African government, I'm going to close my discussion right here. So I want, this is really what's key because you have to understand the motivation of the African government side. Number one, more than anything today, is jobs for young people. Everything comes down to jobs for young people. Because Africa is a continent where the median age is 19.7 years old. In a country like Nigeria, that number is even lower at somewhere like 17, 18 years old. And African leaders and African policymakers are staring down the barrel of a demographic shotgun. That if they cannot build the jobs and the employment opportunities in the next five to 10 years, they have massive problems on their hands. I just wrote a column last week where they did a survey in the Middle East and North Africa, and 42% of young people said they're considering leaving their country. And there's three reasons why they're doing that right now that are bearing down, that are totally transform transforming the China Afri or the African development story. Number one is climate change. Very important. Southern Africa is running out of water. Uh, number two is COVID-19 changing everything because of the economic impact. And number three, China. China is, again, a force for good and a force for bad. We can talk about both. So I can go on for a lot longer, but I want to make sure there's time for Aisha. Um, those are just some of the points that will help kind of get our conversation going. I'm free to talk about anything that you have questions for. So Aisha, I'll hand it over to you now. All right, thanks. Thank you so much, Eric Olanda. Am I audible now? Yes. Is this here? OK, perfect. Sorry for the small glitch. Yes, Aisha, you can go ahead. I'm sharing screen. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Daja Hao and Ndeyewo to the Mandarin and Igbo speakers. I'm Aisha Dochi, 
I'm at Howard University in the PhD program for economics, and I specialize in growth and development studies. So my presentation is on, I'm just seeing if I can minimize this. Okay. My presentation is on identifying opportunities to enhance engagement, a case study in Sino-Nigerian economic relations. So I'm going to take what um, Eric um, was talking about and just, as he said, drill down, <clears throat> looking at uh, the shoe manufacturing industry in Nigeria and Chinese involvement there, and pretty much how can we look at this uh, relationship a little bit differently? We tend to look at it in a very polarized manner. And um, at the end of the day, China has arrived. In Nigeria, this is certainly the case. So at this point, you know, how can we manage the relationship to actually achieve mutually beneficial outcomes? My pr um, presentation is outlined as follows. So my introduction is um, just this, this study comes from a paper uh, on a master's thesis in international relations on a development theory called the flying geese theory. And it's on assessing the viability of foreign direct investment driven industrialization in Nigeria's shoe manufacturing industry. And I felt that these insights are applicable to other host countries that are assigned to the Belt and Road Initiative who are actually trying to seek that elusive win-win developmental cooperation with China. So to begin, the um, at the core of my study is the flying geese theory, which was conceptualized by Kaname Akamatsu in 1962 from Japan. And it was supposed to describe Japan's um, rise after World War II. And so it's a development catch-up theory for latecomer countries. And it's basically become the basis for projections around why China is a leading uh, uh, goose in for the African region as a development partner. And the flying geese theory, um, if you end up searching it or learning more about it, it can be understood in three different ways, but um, in between industry upgrade, within industry upgrade, and also in terms of the international div division of labor. Um, as shown in the scheme um, below. Critical to the flying geese theory is understanding that knowledge and technology transfer are the mechanisms through which um, that, that host country will upgrade through information dissemination. This is critically managed by your host country government. So the host country government has to have the fundamentals to be able to uh, manage a relationship where knowledge and technology transfer is happening between the foreign actor and the local base. And I'll just note that this, um, this knowledge and technology transfer happens both ways. So the foreign actor is also going to be gaining a lot of inside information on how the industry is, how the local terrain is in terms of the business environment. And um, so basically that theory coupled with rising Chinese investment, as Eric had talked about over the 2000s, is why we see that's why we see moving forward a lot of publications that are centering China within Nigeria's development um, development discourse. So broadly, yes, for, for Africa, but um, specifically focusing on Nigeria, I noticed that around um, the 2010s, there's, well, there was a lot of um, publications coming out around technology transfer using the flying geese theory as a basis for the growth identification and facilitation framework, a development strategy that's coming out of the World Bank. And there was extensive research done by um, Irene Sun, who wrote a book that that um, kind of created this new uh, development narrative or um, mainstream, made the, the development narrative more mainstream about China being a partner for um, African countries and particularly Nigeria. And through that um, book, The Next Factory of the World, which is popular in the China-Africa space, she identified one of the subjects that I um, followed up on and did field work um, with. So that would be a flip-flop factory that I'll talk about more in detail later on. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, the, the understanding about China's impact on the um, local community is a little bit different. So um, I was really intrigued by what was happening in Abia State. This is in southeast Nigeria and how they were um, courting Chinese investment and trying to introduce China into the development and industrialization strategy that was happening there. So I was really drawn to the fact that the Abia State governor actually had an industrialization strategy. Um, you know, coming from a developing country, there are a lot of people in um, positions of power who 
you know, don't necessarily have the interests of their communities in mind. So this actually stuck out that he had um, a plan that had several phases. In 2016, there was a launch of a site for Made in Aba Goods. For um, Aba is the local industrial town there that is very um, notorious and well known and um, industrious. So he was trying to promote those goods on the site. He was also courting um, investment Chinese investments and particularly one from uh, a visit from the Huaji and Shoe Factory um, in Ethiopia. The owner there made the news, and because of that, uh, that he had to um, have a meeting with local shoemakers because of their concerns with incoming Chinese industrials competition. In response to that, he partnered with Sichuan Province in order to devise a one-month program for 30 Aba shoemakers to Chengdu, China, and um, they there they learned advanced automation um, techniques in shoe production. Uh, that took place in January of 2018. So by November of 2018, uh, doing my own research, I found out that there was still no um, follow up on the outcomes of that program. So that also became the second subject for my field research to follow up on the program and find out um, what changes, if any, occurred for the participants in that um, training, sorry, in that technical vocational and education training in Chengdu. So my research problem ultimately is, are Chinese private investments and public partnerships actually flying geese in industrializing Nigeria's shoe manufacturing sector? Are these um, investments uh, viable vessels for knowledge transfer in essence? My um, research methodology is a mixed uh, methods approach where I did a literature review and then I conducted field research. And for the sake of time, I will just um, breeze through. Um, so from my literature review, I basically came out with three main gaps that made me question the viability of this foreign direct investment driven um, industrialization plan. Um, they were, uh, does the flying geese theory necessarily result in the creation of indigenous businesses? So that would be businesses owned by Nigerians and not necessarily, or, and not just like another uh, foreign actor that happens to be operating in the sector. Secondly, um, are the uh, enabling fundamentals for Nigeria or for industrialization present? Are they even robust enough to support um, the flying, uh, to support knowledge transfer between a multinational company and the locals? And then finally, can Nigerian enterprises, being that many of them are micro enterprises, compete with these large manufacturing juggernauts? So um, the the main the main piece of evidence that uh, really kind of destabilizes the, the theory just from the onset of doing a literature review is simply looking at history. The history of foreign direct in investment in Nigeria begins with uh, pre-colonial interactions with uh, uh, Britain. So most notably that we have the Royal Niger Company, which is today Unilever, who was um, which was instrumental in the formation of colonial like Nigeria. So already you, that sets a precedence for how foreign actors operate in Nigeria's markets, which are not um, regulated by the way. So by the time that um, the British left um, after colonial independence, October 1 of 1960, then you started to see a wave of Chinese um, industrialists actually coming in. So by 1964, there was one company that became the largest company operating in Nigeria. It was a textile company called Cha Textiles from Hong Kong. And um, so that also means that they were employing a great deal of people. Now, between 1964 and 1973, we have the Biafra War, which some would argue was actually even a genocide. So this was a civil war, and it totally decimated the country and destroyed that industrial base that was left by, left by the British. And um, that obviously is going to raise the barriers to entry. So by 1973, you saw a reduction in the amount of African or sorry, Nigerian owned textile companies operating. And by 1980s, we we're kind of aware of the globalization and liberalization reforms. So structural adjustment programs ultimately devalue the Naira, making it prohibitively expensive to actually have those capital intensive mark, uh, factories for textile production. So in present, 
it's very hard to find a textile mill today. The industry has pretty much declined. And interestingly, again, from Irene Sun's book, she even said, noting, talking about the uh, Chinese impact on the Nigerian textile manufacturing industry, that there was no national allegiance when it comes to making the money for the Chinese entrepreneur. First, the Chinese industrialists helped create the Nigerian textile industry, Cha Textiles, largest company, but then Chinese smugglers helped kill it. Um, so just to know again, um, when and around 1986, because it became so expensive to actually operate machines, it even pushed a lot of Chinese um, factories out of business. So instead, they went into the importation. But um, I think we're familiar with a lot of like Nigerians that will take up that kind of middleman role. By today, that's they're pretty much pushed out because I mean, um, Chinese operators can can do the work just as efficiently, if not more efficiently than um, Nigerians. So the historical legacy of foreign direct investment in, within Nigeria, just generally speaking, um, I, I did look at some other industries. I looked at the auto parts industry um, and I looked at um, uh, agriculture. But the the general effect impact has been a hollowing out of industry, market cannibalization due to the lack of regulations. We were having legal textiles and smuggled textiles coming in. Um, widespread unemployment due to the closure of factories, the sidelining of indigenous participation, and the contribution to the phenomenon of jobless growth that we often hear about when we're talking about African development. And again, this occurs I don't want to say because of foreign direct investment, but it's also because of the environment of Nigeria. And just, again, understanding the developing country context is so critical to the efficacy of these development strategies. Uh, so there were some other points. Uh, and so, again, speaking to the enabling fundamentals, uh, questionable, just given the amount of military rule and military regime, it, it disrupts that continuity of dem democratic tradition. So pretty much that hadn't that didn't exist up until um, 1999. But even still, questions about how democratic Nigeria is currently the president, the pre the current president was previously a um, had been one of a military ruler. So again, we, it's questionable how democratic we are. Um, macroeconomic indicators, um, yes, the, the point that Eric made about youth uh, unemployment is extremely important. So this has been, we see a spike that occurred from, um, in 2013 within Nigeria for youth unemployment rate. And um, we see also a diminishment of real non-oil sectors. So basically the GDP that is coming from areas not within the oil um, industry have been diminishing over the years and um, yeah, so that would include light manufacturing, which I'm studying. So last question. So to answer these gaps, I conducted field research. And I conducted it between August and September of last year, looking at the Ch um, Chinese flip-flop factory, the private factory that was identified in Irene Sun's book, and then looking at the vocational, uh, the, te the technical and vocational training program that was devised by the Abia state government and the um, uh, Sichuan province government. And uh, yes, I will just, I'll just keep moving along. So here's just a map so we can get an idea of where these, where this took place. I began in Lagos and then went to Aba and the distance is about um, one hour by plane, but because of the poor road infrastructure, it's 11 hours by road. So the beginning in Lagos, this is beautiful Lagos. Uh, but I was going to Ikorodu Industrial Estate. So this is where the Chinese flip-flop factory is housed. And interestingly, um, this, this flip-flop factory was established in 1962. So even through the, um, the Civil War, AKA genocide, this company was able to survive. Very interesting, very interesting to me. So on the way to the factory, this is the road that we had to traverse. And again, it gives you a sense of the extreme conditions of the business environment that we're operating in within Nigeria and that this foreign company had to manage and has been managing. And for, for instance, this is even just one of the obstacles we had to pass through just to get to the factory. And this is a um, truck that is overburdened with uh, spare steel and it's stuck in the road because it has been um, eroded due to the rainy season. So it was like stuck in the mud, very dangerous. But we made it to the um, factory. And as you can see from the outside, it's, you know, the pothole ridden, um, unpaved uh, environment. 
and it's very and as soon as you approach the the factory you get a sense of a whole different atmosphere and um environment behind the gates you get a sense also of the size hopefully from this it, it was absolutely massive um maybe uh, several football fields in size was this factory and um once you enter the gates a completely different sense um is evoked once you once you pass through i mean you could even see down to the architecture of the the um building and of the compound these um chinese architectural elements so there as soon as you enter you can you can see that they created basically an ecosystem within all of the chaos of lagos um in order to run their business this is what they produce. They produce a flip flop that's 500 naira. It's pretty much ubiquitous without, throughout Nigeria. It's even featured in this um, contemporary photograph. Um, and it's made out of plastic and styrofoam, entirely produced by machines. And their company um, employs about 3,000 people. It's a conglomerate. So they have a number of factories in steel, plastics, um, and, and um, other production. But this is their footwear factory. And uh, Yes, so that's the shoe that they that they have. And I interviewed two people. I, I had a 90 minute interview with the head of human resources, who was Nigerian and the general manager of the factory, who uh, was Chinese. And again, for the sake of time, I'll just focus on the questions regarding knowledge transfer. So when I was going up to the factory, I even noticed that there was a polytechnic just up the road. But um, when I when when we had the conversation basically they said that knowledge transfer does not take place within the factory there are no formal channels within or or within the local community um why is that the amount of effort and time and money that is spent on just operating their factory they said is enough that they don't have the capacity or the interest of you know um educating their potential future competitors, which is fair. And which is also why the general manager noted that in China, they had deliberate intentional programs on technology transfer that in the West, in the US, they'll call forced technology transfer. But it's the reason why they are, were able to build up companies that are now multinational today. Uh, again, Eric mentioned the techno phones. That's what that's one of the com um, companies that was able to benefit from knowledge transfer from Western companies that came into China. Um, so yes, knowledge transfer is not taking place, but what is, I noticed that instead they, they actually, they have a lot of employees and they actually have a very high employee retention rate. So they said that the, the head of human resources said that it's very common for people to work there for 10, 20, and even 30 years at this, uh, Chinese factory. Why? Because he said that there is transparency and reliability in their remuneration. So in their wage payments, they actually pay their workers. And in the Nigerian business environment, this is distinct for a company because unfortunately there, there is a commonality of not paying workers. Yes, people do have jobs. They dress in uniform and go to jobs that may not pay them. So that's another discussion when we're talking about market failures. But what we can see here sorry okay um what we can see here okay all right um just to wind down yeah so very little with the knowledge transfer and the and this is basically the business model we see capital intensive mass production and domestic oriented takeaways there's more to gain from from chinese inf investment than just machines and, and knowing how to operate machines there there needs to be an understanding also of the how the industry operates and how to operate a factory um, more importantly, I'm seeing that co corporate culture is actually something that could be learned from. How do they manage 3,000 people and run um, a business from 7 a.m. even to 7 p.m. and then sometimes night shifts? That takes a lot of de um, deliberate thinking around how they're managing their labor, and that's something that um, you know can also be learned from. And again, not just machines. And then there is also a point to there is a value of the local market. So since we're running short on time, I'm breezing through what the um, technical vocational and education training. But what we're seeing is that distinct here, the process is artisanal, it's hand, it's um, handcraft production. So very different from the machine operated capital intensive um, uh, business model we saw in Lagos. We also see that there's a huge variety in the production of shoes and the, the designs of shoes, and that it's also majority made from leather. 
So what we're seeing is that for the Nigerian enterprise, they're in a completely different stage of their development. So trying to um, uh, learn, you know, kind of copy the China, Chinese business model is simply, it, it's just simply incongruent and it does not work. So again, it's more a labor intensive batch production export oriented 